Victor wrote, please come and see me. I have something of great importance to discuss with you. As soon as you can, don't tell anyone. Good morning, Sonia. Shouldn't professors be teaching? Well, no more than friends should be unsociable. He's upstairs. Wait here. Morris, you lad. Hello. Oh, why didn't you tell me you were coming? Uh, sit down. He'd been ill. Why hadn't he phoned? Yeah, throw those books on the floor. Why pretend in front of his wife he hadn't called me? Chosen a good day to come. I've been feeling rotten lately, not well at all. But today, uh, look at that sun. Wild, eh? It's gotten right into me, full of youth, lovely. <coughs> Victor ignored the tensions, the mystery. <coughs> Just were pretending that didn't belong to our friendship. <coughs> but then neither was Sonia's sullenness. <coughs> I could remember her, that energetic 40-year-old, good-naturedly bullying the restless Marsden household into order and crying, don't go anywhere with your hands empty, little buggers. And this father figure before me, pushing me into confidence. Shouldn't be misled by Sonia now. now. Makes you want to take press you haven't got. What could have happened? And you'd chosen a good day to come. Now Sorry, didn't to seem to know you'd call me and... Uh... The genuine creative instinct is and always has been a celebratory one. The earliest known forms of painting and ritual may have had to do with magic born of ignorance, but beginnings should not be mistaken for truths. Art may have begun in the belief that the act of mimesis contained magical properties, but once discovered, man looked at himself in wonderment, delighted in it, and thenceforth excelled in it only when his motivation was celebratory. This modest history of art will attempt to prove such. I'm impressed. It's a very good beginning. Very generous theory to want to prove. Congratulations. But first tell me why you're in bed. It's rotten. Clumsy and illiterate like me. Written in the language of the negotiating table. Once a trade union bureaucrat, always a trade union bureaucrat. It is a beginning, I suppose. Now, please, It won't Victor. ever be an erudite work such as you could write, but art is celebratory. And no one, not even you, Professor Morris Stapleton, has attempted to prove why. So old Victor, with his WEA background, his self-taught smatterings and crazy passion for collecting paintings. Now, uh, the trouble is, no one's interested in art. Even artists be made to feel guilty, diminishing their roles like old-fashioned sinners. Me an artist? Oh, no, mate, not me. I'm just ordinary like you and him. Nothing special. I'm sure you could write War and Peace if you tried, or the sonnets, or paint like Leonardo. There's nothing to it, mate. All men are artists. Can't. You haven't even got the artists on your side. I'm dying, man. Six months, nine months a year, they're not certain. But soon. I don't know why I should think it's strange, but I believed him at once. Froze at the shock and with unforgivable rudeness, stared. Before me was a friend who knew the time of his own ending, and there was nothing I could say. Not, don't be silly, not are they sure, not maybe they made a mistake. I'm shattered, I can't say hey, anything. Don't I... worry, man. It's unforgivable, but... To me, the way I told you. I mean, Victor, it's terrible. The thoughtless of me. Well, don't apologize for I expect you to do. I just don't believe it. They made a mistake, that they, they always do. I know of a case, cases. Doctors calculate a year and patients go on and on and on. Oh, Morris, don't bumble that. I'm dying. 
It's my lord Leukemia. I've waited three years for these last months and now they've come. Now, sit down here on the bed mm. and talk. Let Baby. me talk. I'm frightened, no doubt about that. And bitter. Look at that sun. Listen to those sounds. Look at those books. Who'd want to leave all that? Despite all this, allegations of torture to prisoners of war in North Vietnam never stops, does it? Man batters child to death. Youth batter old man to death. Quarter of London's homes without baths and heating. Sectarian killings in Belfast. Famine in India. Still, 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 still. After all we did, all we did. I wouldn't like to leave any of it. I'd live with it all just so long as I could live. They retired me from the Union just in time, didn't they? I'll tell you a story. Told me by the head of one of the largest unions in West Germany. Fantastic fellow he was. Still is, I suppose. God knows, you lose touch with him. You share some conference or other together. Bosom pals. Consoled each other through those boring affairs. Oh, by God, we used to get some boring all sorts of those conferences. Self-righteous little functionaries they were. But not Hoider. Wolfgang Hoider. <laughs> Very vivid he was. Dragged into the Wehrmacht when he was 15, last month of the war. I was probably chasing him one of my tanks. It was him who told me this story. But it seems that their regiment picked up a deserter. Some poor scrawny old man who'd been out of it all, but... Now they were taking anyone who could hold a rifle. Well, he'd no appetite for the glorious Third Reich right from the start, so he'd precious little urgency to die for it in his last gasps. Who would? So off his scarp, and he could smell defeat. But um, he'd no energy. Food supplies low, foot sore, wheezing. He was caught, court martialed, and sent us to a firing squad. Well, this depressed everyone, it seemed. No one had the stomach for it. Not even the regiment commander. But he was an old soak. Duty was duty, regulations was regulations. There had to be a trial, there had to be a fair trial, there had to be a sentence, and it had to be carried out. Victims of law and order when all law and bloody order were crumbling about them. <laughs> Madness, eh? Still, the commander was an honorable man, and he asked the prisoner if he'd any last requests. You know what the poor bugger asked for? A plate of barley soup. Wanted to eat before dying. Go off on a full stomach, as it were. Well, it was staple fare, and there was some left over to be heated up in the kitchen, so they gave him what he asked for. A plate of barley soup. And when he'd finished it, now listen to this. When he'd finished it, he asked for another plate. Well, this were unprecedented. But nothing in the rules to say a prisoner couldn't have as much of his last request as he wanted, and rules were rules. So, another plate were called for, and the man ate it slowly. And when it were finished, yes, he asked for another plate. And this time they had to wait while it was being made, because they'd run out of the previous night's leftovers. And he ate, and he ate, and he ate, and he ate. Barley soup. More than he wanted. More than he could take. Anything, so long as it delayed the moment of his death. Do you know what happened? The Russians came. The sentence couldn't be carried out. Everyone fled and he lived. He couldn't have known he was going to live. But some instinct kept him eating. Eating to stay alive, eh? Simple. I've given you a real shock, lad. Terrible. Look at those pillars. Fresh every day. She changes them every day. Believe it or not, I get into fresh sheets every night. I tell her there's no need, but she takes no notice. You paid good money on a washing machine, I'll use it, she says. I love it, because. I'm sorry, lad. You look quite pale, daft bugger me. Oh, no, don't stop feeling sorry for me, for Christ's sake. That's absurd. That's... Oh, Victor.
to. Oh, Jesus, Victor, I wish at this moment I was a religious man. I wish I could tell you something about heaven, reincarnation, and afterlife. So. Right. That's what I really want to talk about. That, afterlife, just that. How about a cup of tea first, eh? Go down, ask Sonia to make us a pot of tea, eh? Oh. While she's making it, go in the lounge and read that. I'll have a rest me in while. I'm tired easily these days. Only for Christ's sake, don't let Sonia see you reading that letter. And don't tell her anything. She doesn't know. Unsteady legs. I've given him unsteady legs. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't yet learned to be somber all the time. <laughs> Sacrilegious of me, isn't it? Confusing. <laughs> For. What time stories, Sonia? He's full of them. I never tire. Victor asked me to come I down and get. I know what Victor asked you. I'll wait in the lounge. I was thinking the other day. I used never to be able to call you darling. Do you remember? When we first met, I was really plain. Plain-minded, I mean, not looking. I was pretty looking, but I felt daft saying darling and sweetheart and those things. It took about two years before I could bring myself to call you any but your name. And I only ever gave in because you bullied me, got proper annoyed, in fact. You made me say the word, forced me. Remember? I do. It was after we'd been to have tea with my grandmother. A Sunday afternoon. One of those big spreads. Everything thrown on the table, you know, from homemade pickle onions to thick old crusty rhubarb pies. And she was making a usual fuss of me. Adored me, she did. And I did her too. And she was teasing me and saying, she's a little darling. Isn't she a little darling? She's my little darling. <laughs> And when we walked home, you turned on me and said, uh, she can say the word, why can't you? What word, I asked. Darling, you yelled. Go on, say it. You did look funny. Your face all angry while your mouth was saying words of loving. <laughs> Didn't go together somehow. Say darling, you shouted at me. You made me giggle. And the more I giggled, the more angry you got. But you won. You made me say it. Darling, sweetheart Victor, dearest Victor, darling Victor, darling, darling in my heart. I was remembering, just today, for no reason, while I was outside cleaning the windows. Ah, tea. Uh, tastes. I'm really tasting everything now. When I gave up smoking, all tastes came back. And now the lot's coming back. Tastes, colours, shapes. Everything's vivid, stands out. And everything has to be special, too. Little things like tea. That has to be the real thing, don't your old tea bags? And coffee. That has to be real beans, ground. What do you mean, instant? 
And food. Must have food with its own flavours. I get neurotic if the cabbage stays weedy and watery. You know, the lamb gets shredded like old bootlaces. Sonia? Hi, Sonia. Came a few days ago with the rest of the post, fully stamped. Posted from our post box at the end of the road. And written, presumably, in the downstairs lounge while I was upstairs in the bedroom. It was a strange incident, a wife sending such a letter to her husband with no date, no beginning, no ending, just like that for no reason. But it was obvious that Victor, as yet, saw no significance in it and was more anxious to tell me what was really on his mind. He dipped the homemade cake into his tea, sucked the juice and began. This, more or less, is what he said. About three years ago, I began to suffer with headaches and dizziness. We're in the middle of the hospital workers' strike. Remember, daft government policies. What a time that was. All night discussions about compromise, open air gatherings up and down the country, the lot. So, blood pressure, I thought. Went for a checkup. Nothing. And blood pressure was high, but nothing pathological. And general condition was good. Next day, phone call. Specialist assistant. Would I go in and see them? Something's cropped up. When I saw the specialist next day, he said, high white corpuscle count, just like that. Almost angrily, as though I were to blame. <laughs> I'd been told you got an overdraft. And then, well, I was curious. Curious about what was happening to me. Curious, you know, like a bystander. It was strange. I had no sense of shock or fear. No sweating or increased pulse, just a, a great slowing down of time. Everything in slow motion. Don't ask me to be logical about it. I can only tell you how it happened in this order, as I'm telling you. And then, into this slow motion, came this great increase of... Oh, don't laugh. It's difficult for me to say it. This great increase of love... I didn't feel it, wasn't that. It's just I had a better sense of it. And then relief. I was aware of how tired life had made me and how tired I was of myself. And how now, now, I could be held responsible for nothing ever again. Sonia asked me what it were, and I, I told her it was the strike, but she'd seen me in strike times before, so I had to tell her half the truth that I'd been to see a doctor and he told me to take it easy because of high blood pressure. Anyway, um, we're not certain, the specialist said, but all the evidence points to myeloid leukemia. Well, I knew the implication of that, of course, but I wanted to hear it spelt out. 50% of the people in your condition live three years, he said. Of the other 50%, some live for five, some for ten. Few have been known to live for twenty. A few have died within the year, but that's rare. You have my answer. I had his answer, all right. But as you say, they can be wrong. It's been known. So uh, I went to someone else. What a bastard he turned out to be. Die-hard old Tory had obviously always hated my guts. When I asked him for a prognosis, he said, you got any papers that need signing, you better sign them. If you um, if you want to make a fortune, better start making it now. Well, I ignored all that and asked him about the possibility of a cure or spontaneous recovery. You know what he said? Cure is a dirty word. <laughs> all right, bastard he were. It was from my own doctor, my own old GP, I managed to gain a little comfort. I remember he embraced me first, and then he said, you're not worried, are you, Vic? You're not gonna die of leukemia. Heart attack, maybe, plane crash, anything, but not leukemia. My Lord, leukemia, he said, for a person in your condition and your age, is a benign ailment. Eat very well, go to bed early, get up a bit later, avoid infections, keep in the open air as much as possible, and don't tell anyone. It only creates the wrong atmosphere. Oh, great man, that. He restored my sanity. So, there it is. 
I belong to the 50% the last three years. My time's up. My lair and the pure and ethos are having less and less effect. I'm up and I'm down. I recover, but I recover more slowly. Still looks like high blood pressure to Sonia, but I know, I know what's happening to me. He wanted to carry on, but he was grey. As though ashes from a doused fire had settled on him. I stood up, anxious. It's all right, it's just a turn. I'll be all right after a sleep. But you better go. Come again soon. Tomorrow, the day after. Leave your bloody students. Tend to me. I really need you, Maurice Lad. And, and don't, I beg you, don't tell Sonia. My most difficult moment was passing Sonia. She seemed to be waiting to see what state I'd be in. It was unnerving. I fled and she saw me out of the house with fury. And I understood none of it. Three days later, I had another note from Victor. With it was the second letter from Sonia. You used to tease me about God. Soft brain I had in them days. Could I help it though? Well, my soft brain, yes, but not my religiousness. That was my upbringing. No one can be blamed for that. Though they do say the sins of the father shall fall upon the sons, but that's cruel and unreasonable. Not that you were like that. You weren't cruel and unreasonable. No, never. I'm not saying that. But you teased. And you shouldn't have done because I was very hurt by it. You didn't know that I was, but I was. Very hurt, to begin with. And then my brain got hard. God is one man's invention to frighten other men into being good, you said. But no one's good if they're frightened. That's what you said. And it sounded very reasonable to me. Besides, there was the war and all of them soldiers being gassed and slaughtered. And then it happened to my brother Stan, so I couldn't much believe in God. But I missed him. I don't mind telling you, I miss God. He used to give me lovely pictures to think about. It was a long time before I knew what it was you gave me. Better. You know that, don't you? After the teasing and tormenting, my brain got harder. And I grew proud of what I got to understand. And now I could listen to you and your mates arguing and saving the world and make up my own mind. Did you know I grew? Couldn't talk or argue much or write, but I grew from God to you. Became a woman. For a while, at least. Two weeks passed before I heard from Victor again. Did you call this friendship? Victor, how are you? I sent you something. I sent it back. No, not Sonia's letter, my notes. I sent you some new pages of my bloody book. Must have begged for comments, a best friend. Well, as a matter of fact, I was just reading them and planning to come and see you. Well, come, lad. Come, then. Don't take notice of me. Just come. Can't bear heavy skies. Sooner imagine it were night time than face morbid bloody clouds. Look at those stunned, starched, overfed cushions. They reproduce themselves when I'm not looking. Well, aren't they a mess? All first drafts are a mess. A too. mess? Confused gibberish. When I wrote all that down, I thought I was at the beginning of a profound inquiry that would unravel why everyone assumes it's a rotten life. Have you noticed that? Everyone says it's a rotten life. People are rotten. Life, literature, all filled with characters whose experience of the world is depressing. So, so who upsets them? Speak to the man who they say has upset them, and you find that he also thinks the world's a terrible place and people are rotten. So, so who upsets him? Everyone says it's a terrible life. 
and it never seems possible to lay a finger on the culprit, the cause. Oh, I know people have got answers, religious, political, philosophical, but at the end of everyone's life, whether he's a revolutionary, a dictator, a pope, a millionaire, a worker, prime minister, citizen of the West, socialist citizen, great artist, great scientist, great philosopher, for all of them, terrible life. At the end of it, they're all weary and disillusioned and dispirited. I mean, listen to Ruskin. Now, who could want to have achieved more, but was he happy? I forget now what I meant by liberty in this passage, but often use the word in my first writings in the good sense, thinking of Scott's moorland rambles and the like. It is very wonderful to me now to see what hopes I had once. But Turner was alive then, and the sun used to shine, and the rivers to sparkle. No, it's too late, Morris lad. We're a trade union leader too long. I should have given up at 40 and started studying for my book then, but not now. Not even with your help. He'd told me what he wanted to tell me, and now he was tired. As I was going, he said... Don't neglect me, Morris. Don't neglect an old friend. I told him not to be an idiot that I had to go to the States for a fortnight's lecture tour, but I'd see him as soon as I returned. He gave me another letter on blue paper to read. Read it on the plane, he said. The only time I ever swore was a night you got more than normal drunk and wet because things weren't going right in the union and you began complaining at me. You told me, you don't care about me or my state or the fact that I'm losing my nerve and failing my mates, do you? And you haven't to care for rights, no conditions, no wages, no nothing. Remember that? How you raged and wept and screamed. I'm going to pieces. I'm going to pieces and you don't care and you don't understand. Very loud you were that night, my love, and I railed back. Of course I care, of course I understand, but I won't give consolation to a man when he's filled with pity and shit. That's what you are, I said. You fill with pity and shit. Oh, it's the only time you wept, and I swore that was. And that was a tense time. Very tense that was, my love. I'm laughing as I write it down. <laughs> he looked so funny, so startled. I felt very booked with myself to have startled you so. <laughs> it was serious then, but I confess how I giggled afterwards. I went away and giggled to myself. <laughs> I'm laughing even as I write about it. <laughs> Full of pity and shit, I said. <laughs> you forgot all about you going to pieces then, I. You were so shocked. <laughs> pity and shit. <laughs> As soon as I returned from the States, I visited Victor. You again? Here.
He's not upstairs. He's in the garden. Thank you. Find the time, then. You two been quarrelling? We never quarrel, we only ever sulk. Well, she's sulky. Why? Would you believe it? She wants me to get out of bed and pack a bag and go with her for a week to Mithelmroyd on the moors where we used to court. Now, isn't that daft? There's a daft thing for you. Does she know I'm bloody dying? No, she doesn't, poor bitch. It's no good, Morissa. I can't take it. Thought I had it in me, but I haven't. Frightened. So frightened and unhappy. You think something will happen? Someone. A discovery in time. Something always did, didn't it? When we made fools of ourselves, we got ill, we were help, a cure, forgiveness. I can't really be dying. It's just plain silly. But all this, gone, stopped, done. Such a burden, this knowledge. I feel so humiliated watching myself become frightened. No one should have to know it. It's not fair. A man's not made to live with such knowledge. Look at it. Love it. I love it, love it. I just plain and simply love it. Bloody hell. Bloody hell. Don't let her see me like this. I'd be murdered to play. Kill me, she would. Kill me. I found it in a little junk shop in New Bedford. Look at it carefully. What's the signature? John Rushton. Are you sure it's it says Rushton? Rushton? That's what I thought at first, but look again. Rushton? Ruskin, that's all I can see. What about Ruskin? Ruskin? My God, it could be. It just could be. Well, isn't that a thing? Oh, that's revived me no end, that has. You're a lovely friend. Think of my jadedness. Ruskin. There's no doubt about it. The soul does depend upon the body. I've started trying to imagine what this other place is like. I mean, supposing it did exist, just supposing, what could it be like? I mean, I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like visually. Where do you place it? There's some afterlife. 
And I think to myself, it's it's not a physical place, Victor. It's where you go wrong. It's a spiritual state. A state of awareness, unconfined by physical framework. So I lie up there, trying to project myself into a spiritual state of awareness, unconfined to a physical framework. If you ever tried to do that, you try that sometime. Then I get angry. And I say to myself, darkness, nothing. When you're dead, that's it. Over. Done. If you want satisfaction, Victor Lad, look to your past. Your political battles, the fights you fought for other men. But who can do that for long? Dwell on the past and go scratching around for bits of victory. A smug man, perhaps. I'm not a smug man, Maurice. I never was. So what's left? No afterlife I can conceive of. And no past to feel at peace with. So I go round and round in circles, driving myself mad. Because even the very act of contemplating it, me thinking about whether there's a heaven, another life, the very worrying about such things makes me feel guilty and shabby. You, Victor, worrying about where you're going? Frightened, are you? I told myself. Frightened, you poor, feeble-minded man. You used to be so confident about it all. Beginning with birth, ending with death. You want a nice, comfortable little heaven to go to now, do you? And I'm a merciless boogie, you know. I really get to the heart of myself where it hurts. I've always been like that. Have you ever thought the tone of voice your conscience has? They're all different, you know. Everyone's conscience talks to them in a different tone of voice. Mine sneers, very acidy. A Ruskin. What do you know? Victor, you haven't forgotten? No, 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 lass. You wouldn't believe it, but when there's no one in the house, she's a changed woman. She becomes visibly younger, playful and tender. You know how it is when some people are, are angry, they they turn well ugly. They're, the face collapses, become defeated with only irritation, get heavy and vicious. She even treats me like a stranger then. But when they're gone, she's full of outrage and she's magnificent. Even that massive bulk of hers moves elegantly. Just now she's heavy as a landslide because a gaggle of old colleagues are due here in half an hour. God knows what for. Is that my cue to go? No, good God, no. You stay here while I change. I'm not going to let that lot see me in bedclothes. Stop this, for Christ's sake. It's not an easy world, and I'm far from being the most perfect of men, but you've been given no cause to be so unfriendly. Even if only because Victor needs our friendship, you ought to be more... more gracious. She was so resolutely uncommunicative that I decided it was best to abandon her presence. She had her reasons for hostility, and whether justified or not, it seemed futile to seek explanations for them. The front room reflected in a way I'd not noticed until now. They're two distinct personalities. The bright colours, the cleanness, the scrubbed prettiness was hers. The heavy used furniture was his. The plain and framed Victorian weaving of flowers was hers. The modern prints, his. The highly polished brass and copper were hers. The sculpture, his. Even the glass cabinet contained two tastes. The porcelain was Victor's. The cut glass was Sonia's. And yet, what bound both tastes so that each sat at peace with the other? It took me some time to discover, but suddenly I realised what it was. Every item, chosen by no matter whom, had been chosen because the owner had cared deeply for it for one reason or another, 
and so a strange harmony pervaded in which every piece seemed with grace to acknowledge and permit the other's existence. It affected me pleasantly. With relief, I discovered myself unable to remain angry over Sonia's rudeness, at which moment I sat down weary in the dark-stained Windsor chair, which I also discovered swivelled, and swivelled myself round and round in front of the roll-top desk, until my eye caught a familiar sheet of blue paper, innocently waiting to be sent. The lilac is dead. Don't ask me how, but it had a blight. Remember the lilac? We planted it 41 years ago and uprooted it four times for four changes of house. It survived all those uprootings and now... <laughs> I'd be lost without my garden. It's not just a place I potter around in, you know. I think you think it is. Thank God she's occupied, you say to yourself, I bet. No. It's a place where I think my best thoughts, my only thoughts, in fact, even though they don't amount to many, and where I touch all manner of things, like earth and leaves and squashed worms and stones and colours and fresh air and smells and winds and clouds and rain and sunlight and... Oh, the cycle of things. You used to be like that, loving the cycle of things. It's you I got it from. Remember how the lilac came? You brought it home one day and said we must start a garden. You got it from the old railway porter. It was a sucker and you told me lilac cuttings were always suckers from the roots, not from the branch. A thin thing it was then. There was only a few whispery strands between living and dying. I didn't think it would take, but you did. And it started our garden off. What about those arguments we had? We had our first rouse over our first garden. What shape it should be, what should grow in it, which way it should face. You would insist the sun came up in one place. Well, I knew darn well it came up in another. So what did we do? Daft buggers. We set the alarm to get up before sunrise. <laughs> you were wrong, of course. You've no idea how important it was to me to have been right about that. It was my first landmark. Gave me great confidence, that did. And as for the quarrels about what we should grow, well, I thought it'd end our marriage. I wanted more veggies and you wanted more flowers. You said it wasn't a real saving to grow our own veggies, only an illusion. But you said, all right, we'll have more veggies, only I had to keep accounts. You made me work out what it cost in seed and labour and I had to weigh all that grew and then check it with the price in the markets and make a sum of it all. And I did it too. Worked. All I was figuring it out. <laughs> Mad people. But I loved it. Columns of figures, all very neat and very grand headings, look very important. I got top marks at school for neatness. Loved it. And was I proud? I was proud. It gave me a great pleasure. And I was right. Again. It did pay to grow our own veggies. That was my second landmark. A huge garden. Planted everything in it by the sun. When you insisted I learn to drive a car, that was a landmark. When you asked me to show the Italian delegation round London without you, that was a landmark. When you first went abroad for a fortnight and I carried my affairs and your affairs alone without you, that was a landmark. When you first put your head between my legs, that was a landmark. When... That intimacy embarrassed me. I tried to pretend even to myself that I'd not been reading the letter. At the same moment, the house moved into action. I had not seen Victor in clothes for a long time. The effect was shattering. They hung uncomfortably, pointlessly, as though on an alien body. His attempt to show he was still very much in the land of the living boomeranged. He looked the dying man he so wanted not to appear. Then I realised a most curious moment had happened. Both Sonia and I had registered each other's response. Had she understood? She quickly left the room, leaving Victor to quiz me with a look. I couldn't be certain 
I only felt that that moment had brought Sonia and I closer together, and I felt a spiritual double agent in collusion with them both. The men were from the executive of Victor's old union. They'd come to ask if he'd permit a new headquarters to be named after him, and would he open it in nine months' time? I am fundamentally opposed to a building being named after anyone. But I'd love to see myself made an exception of. <laughs> On one condition, uh -huh. that you assure and promise me a sum of money will be set aside for the purchasing of prints and paintings of young artists to go on the walls. I think that's an excellent idea. Well, you know it's so been sure. my passion to help young painters and civilise you barbarians. <laughs> <laughs> His well, performance was a joy. Like a sensitive political yeah, right. Geiger counter, he could squeeze between prejudice and bloody-mindedness. It was a huge power, and he'd been loved by the rank and file for not abusing it. The encounter tired him, but none of his old comrades could see that. That's what they did, always. Drained you, selfish men. You never surrounded yourself with selfish men who used you. <clears throat> Built the careers on you and then left you. Selfish men. Selfish men! You're not going, are you? Well, I think you need to rest, dear friend. No, I'll help you undress first, dear. Then you can go. Ten minutes. Now, what's ten minutes to you, hmm? Uh, just give me a hand up. That's the start. Just between you. Please, all right. That's lovely. Thank you. She was always like that, anxious about abuse. Me, I never worried. Yeah, they were a lonely life. In order to make one friend, you had to let dozens abuse you. Not her, though. I always took it easy, she always scowled. Let the lads come, always said. They ate a little, drank, lingered. My family's atmosphere was like that. Open house. Not hers, though. Give everything to the friends she loved, but everything. Mean as old socks to the rest. I'll tell them. The lads will be interested. Keep well now. Don't do anything rash. Oh, he knew he had to go then. Goodbye, Mrs. Marsden. He's looking very well, so don't you worry. Now, anything we can do, don't forget, contact us. Don't we'll... forget to close the door firmly on your way out. Patronizing little upstart. Nothing can touch him. Watch him go back and say to his bumptious little colleagues, I had a word with old Vic and he agreed with me this and he agreed with me that. Bloody little opportunist. Unicrats, I call them. Ratty catties. <clears throat> I'll find ways of scaring the buggers off, see if I don't. <laughs> Take him up his tea, Morris. He'll be needing it after that demoralising encounter. A bloody eyesight's going. They told me that would go. Jesus Christ, I just have to sit here and watch myself disintegrate. You know, Morris, I think it is a Ruskin. No, compare it with this facsimile of his signature. Mine's a bit shaky, that's all. Mine's an earlier sketch, but... Now, how in the hell did he get to New Bedford, eh? Mm. There's a story for someone. What lies are wrapped round the voyage of that, eh? Who was the barely dressed smart young man? Hmm? Oh, a young father from one of the printing chapels. They want to come out on token sympathy stripe with the footplate men. You know what the real problem is of industrial relations? To try to sort out the true militants of the holiday makers. 
And there are a lot of them, and the bullies with it, cheap Chicago-style mobsters. I said to him, while you're on strike, losing a week's wages, which they can ill-bloody afford, while you're being loyal and comradely and losing your wages, do you know where RSD is? He's the General Secretary. No, he said, where? In the bloody Canary Islands, having holiday, I said. Buying a house for himself out of union funds for when he retires. And do you know what this young fella did? You never believe him. He grinned. He grinned and he nudged me and he said, now isn't that just like RSD? He admired it. Admired his union boss for being like all the employers, so as to show they could screw their way into power and affluence the same as them. Doesn't that depress you? Depresses the hell out of me. You can't win now, Morris. If capitalism hasn't built up a resistance to criticism, it's created an enemy as monstrous as itself. No antibiotics left. Hurts. What a mess, eh? What a waste. What a life. Could have the, uh, the Ruskin frame for me, please? Yes, no problem. You know, sometimes I feel guilty dozing on it of an afternoon. I fear she may come up and change it twice a day. <laughs> It had been a week since I'd last seen him. Something was off-key in the way he'd been speaking. It was as though he'd been guiltily trying to ward off a moment of confession. They, um, they want me in hospital a few days. A week, maybe. Um, preliminary test, you know, the sort of thing. I think I may have found a new drug. Found a new drug? Well, what good news? But why look so down? Don't you know what scientists can do these days? I suppose I could more easily bring myself to believe in the possibility of a cure than an afterlife. You're still dwelling on such morbid prospect. Even if I'm cured, Morris Lad, it won't stop me thinking about an afterlife. I've been too near it to stop contemplating it now. Two arrived in one day. How about that? She wrote one and sealed the envelope. Then she wrote another and didn't open the first to put them together. She posted them separately. I think there's something wrong with her blood and all. On the day we got married, I thought you hated me. I must tell you that because it's the only time I've seen hate in your eyes. What am I doing marrying a man who hates me, I thought to myself. You were so silent, so angry. But afterwards, well, I didn't ever say, but I used never to be able to take my eyes off you. No one had ever been so, so tender and certain. And you used to sing. Once a visitor came from abroad, I can't remember where, France, I think, and he said to me, good God, there's someone who can still sing. Our little son sang also. I remember we'd wake and find him standing up in his cot looking down on us, not crying, not murmuring, or nothing, just patiently waiting for us to wake up. And when we did, he was the first thing we looked at, and he knew it, and waited for it, and then gave us a slow smile and started to hum. Nearly every morning was like that. You were daft about him. You wanted him to be a composer. You used to play classical records in the bedroom while he was asleep. It's best it sinks into him unconsciously, you said. Weird theories you had. You wouldn't ever tell him to think of music as a career. That would put him off. But if it went in subliminally, subliminally, do you know, I couldn't remember that word, blessed if I could, but I knew you'd said something like that, and I've just spent all hour looking through the dictionary for it. Lots of lovely words in the dictionary, but I can't remember them. Did you know a ciderite was a steel-coloured stone? That to sibilate was to hiss? That a salatium was a sum of money paid for injured feelings? And salatsi was a stick of licorice? And that licorice is not licorice, as I've always called it, no. It's to be good like a cook at preparing dainties, only they stopped using that word in 1600 and started to use the word lycoris. There. You see what writing to you does for me? Where was I? Oh, music. There was one day, my 
God, don't I remember that day. The children must have been about nine and eleven, and you took us up a climb on the peaks. Dangerous old route you took us. You were scared too. You won't remember it, but you got us onto a tricky part where you had to go back and forwards across a gap four times in order to help me and the children, and you were sweating. The children thought it was great fun. They would. You'd never let them be frightened of anything. Not always a good thing, I thought. Still, I remember that trip for three reasons. The dangerous climb was one. The other was you letting out by accident that you'd had a girlfriend before me who'd climbed with you on that same walk. You blushed when you realised it had been let out. In fact, I wasn't sure if you were talking about a girlfriend before me or after me. And the third thing was the song we sang at the top when we got there. We ate the sandwiches and there was a big wind and you cried out like a madman. We must sing against the wind, good for the lungs and the spirit. So you taught us around. The words were, by the waters, the waters of Babylon, we lay down and wept and wept. For these I am, thee remember, thee remember, thee remember, these I am. What did it mean? I never knew what it meant, not all this time. We wept for these I am. What are these I am? Do you think you got it wrong? We all used to get songs wrong as children. I used to think it was good King Wences last looked out. Instead of good King Wences last looked out. Perhaps it should have been these I am. Perhaps we should have wept for these I am. Oh no. Now I'll come to think of it. You're probably right after all. And we wept because I am these things, we are these things, all are these things. I can only remember the air raising climb, nothing else. They're getting better. Each one more fluent than the last. It's obviously giving her a great deal of pleasure to write them. More fluent and madder. In this one, she wants us to go on holiday and visit the children. So? So, so, all the way up the Orkneys to see Graham doing research into God knows what, thank you. We don't even know where Hilda and Osmond are. Some archaeological dig somewhere. What's the good of all those savings to us when we're too old to use it? That's what I say, and you should say it too. She's mad, we got no savings. A few hundred pounds. Travel? She's not simply talking about travel. She's talking about plans to do things. It seems to me that on this hope of a new drug... What new drug? It's not even been tried yet. May end up that old drug. And what plans? I've got plans. I want to write this book. What should I want to travel for? Haven't I done enough of that sort of thing? I'm tired now. Stupid woman. She hated me being a trade union leader, you know, hated it. Man is a political or social animal she could never understand. Men were either good or bad, selfish or generous, sensible or idiots. Never victims. Discussion, debate, consideration of political principles, foreign language to her. It used to make her so angry I was tied up in it all. Not, not that I didn't want to involve her, I, I did. And, to begin with, it were grand. She was curious about everything. But later, she deliberately crept into the background. The years between 40 and 50 were worst. Like strangers were there. Hardly ever spoke. Terrible time, that. For us. But not... Funny this. Not for her. She seemed to grow in confidence, cockiness. Independent, some bloody thing or other. Grow, mature, take over. Oh, that were it. She took over. All but my general secretaryship. Became another woman. Formidable. A huge presence. I could never laugh when she was around, even when there was something to laugh at. Unhappy people don't like you laughing, do they? 
Here are some more notes of that bloody boot. They're no good. A waste of everyone's time. Would you keep the illusion going for me and have them tied, please? You're a very remarkable man, Victor. Wasted on union matters. Wasted? You think so? Are you charitable? The men had to be protected. You should have seen some of the employers I had to protect them from. Wish they hadn't needed protection. Looked after their own bloody selves. There it is. It's done now. That day, on leaving him, I went through a strange and rather shaming experience. Driving off in the car, I switched on the radio at the moment the Janacek Sinfonietta was at its height, a passage full of tall mountains and echoes. And immediately, I swung into happy accompaniment, singing with the orchestra. A sense of elation overwhelmed me. I was relieved, deliciously grateful that someone else was dying. And not me. Not me. A week later, I visited Victor in hospital. He'd been in three days. No glaring white cushions starched crisp with love and protection against the world were on this bed. It was a metallic thing of cleanliness only. It's going to be a long job. Longer than I thought. Longer than they told me, in fact. Your notes. Typed. It's no good. I'm going blind. Oh, bloody Christ, Morris. They're good notes, Victor. Fine. Some things I don't agree with, of course. You'd expect that, but... Uh, it has the makings of a unique little book on art, I promise you. You don't believe in God, do you, Professor? I don't really think I can. Right, you can't. Nor can't I. But the ceasing forever for all, of all this, that doesn't make sense either. Because some people to whom it makes ecstatic sense, but they're a type. The put-downers, I call them. Know what I mean? Every bloody opportunity they get, they enjoy putting men down. They have a special tone of voice, sort of voice that rubs its hands together. Look at the ocean, they cry. See what a little thing is man in all that sea. And when space travel came, they had a real ball. Look at the stars. How insignificant is man now? Instead of marvelling that man could make it to the bloody moon, they found it another opportunity of putting him down. Now, there's those stupid computers. How oh, they love putting men down because they can't store up facts mechanically. But a computer's a poor thing compared to a brain, surely. I mean, bloody hell, I'm no scientist. Even I know that. Can't store a shred of what the brain can. But on they go, the poop downers. Of which I mercifully have never been one. So it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Well, I know it's going to happen because I've seen death happen. Nothing's ever stopped it happening. But it just doesn't make sense. It's so, so unjust. There's no reason for it. I mean, what have I done to have all those bloody marvellous things taken away from me? What, 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 for Christ's sake? The outburst wrung me unbearably. I wanted to talk like a schoolmaster and say stupid things such as pull yourself together, dignity, self-respect. But half of me screamed with him at the injustice. It was unjust. Then he handed me a letter on blue paper and turned his head away. You took me and you shaped me and you gave me form. 
Not a form I couldn't be, but the form I was meant to be. You needed only to be in the house, and I felt my life and the lives of the children I cherish could never go wrong. It was so. They never did go wrong. They have confidence and pity and daring in them. And in me there are flowers, blossoming all the time. Explosions of colour and energy. You see it, surely. Surely you see it. Or feel it. There's nothing I couldn't do. In me is you. All you've given me. I've been a white sheet. A large white canvas. And you've drawn the world upon me. Given outline to what was mysterious and frightening in me. Do you know how proud I've been of you? Do you know I felt myself beautiful only because you chose me? Do you know that I've shuddered with pleasure to think you love me? You are my rock, my hero, my love. I feel such strength. Do you know these things? It has to be changed every three hours. Stop the flow and I die. Look at it. Bottle of someone else's blood. Just that red stuff in there to keep me able to see you, to talk, think, remember, and reason. Bloody bed sores. Got a rubber ring under my backside, it makes no odds. Lying horizontal stops the blood circulating. Well, this is it, isn't it, Morris? Oh, don't protest, lad. I don't think I'm mind quite so much now. In fact, I got my curiosity back. You know what helped? Woke up the other day. Suddenly, out of the blue, no connection with anything, I thought, Leonardo da Vinci is dead. That seemed reassuring. So I went on. Mozart is dead. Socrates is dead. Shakespeare, Buddha, Gandhi, Jesus, Marx, Chiardi, they're all dead. One day, Sonny will die. My son Graham, he'll be dead. My daughter Hilda. My son Jake. So will all the grandchildren. There seemed a, a great unity to it all, a great simplicity, comforting. Poor Morris. Oh, my beloved, my dearest, dearest one, I have adored you. Do you know that? That I'm full of you? Do you know it? Know it? That I feel you there as I felt my children in me. Your blood in my blood, rivers of you. Do you know it? Do you? Do you? The sound of your voice, your judgments, your praise, your love, your pity, all in me. Do you know it? My darling. Oh, my darling, nothing has been wrong for me and nothing will be. I'll give you my everything. Cut from me my everything. Lips, if you want, ears, breast, heart. All my body's everything to flow in you. What nonsense do I write instead of just I love you. And I always have loved you. But I must catch up on the too much silence. So this nonsense, this silliness, this too much writing and talking and shouting is all for you because I can trust it all and anything to you. Don't you know now what I feel? Can't you feel what I feel, mad old woman that I am now? Can't you understand? I rip myself apart for you, oh, my beloved. Oh, my sweet, sweet, sweetest one. Why am I so clumsy? 
I've always been so clumsy. Never graceful as you deserved. Wretched body, wretched heart, dull old mind. Not any part of me good enough for you, I know, but oh, I love you, love you, love you. Oh, my Victor, Victor, love you, Victor, love you. Oh, my Victor, my heart. Four days later, when I arrived at the hospital, they told me Victor had died. Half an hour previously. His family was in there. Did I want to go in? I said no, I'd wait till they came out. Was I Professor Morris Stapleton? Yes, I said. She brought me a package, clumsily wrapped in a white paper bag, bound by two wide brown elastic bands. Victor had left me the notes for his book, and the letters from Sonia. Among them, the last one he'd received. As I was thinking to open the letter, Sonia came out of the ward, surrounded by all the family. She was thinner and looking magnificent with her black hair swept back in a tight bun and fierce, as though defiantly gathering strength to be the bridge between the dead and the living at her side, who, it struck me, she held to her as evidence that sentence of death could not be passed. We kissed, hugged briefly, but said nothing. She took her children away. I sat in the corridor to read her last letter before going in to see my friend. Like all of them, it was on blue paper and had no date, no beginning, no ending. There will be, my darling one, I know it, a blinding light, a painful light, when suddenly the lie will fall away from truth. Everything will make its own and lovely sense. Trust me. Trust me. It won't be logical or happy, this sense, but clear. Everything will become clear. Trust me. Contradictions won't cease to be contradictions, I don't say that, but nor will they any longer confuse. I'm not promising all will seem to have been good, but evil won't bewilder you as it once did. Trust me, I adore you. And with this blinding light will come an ending to all pain. The body's pain, the heart's pain, the pain in your soul. All in a second, less than a second, less than, less than a second. I'm sure of it. That's how it'll be for us all. I've always known it. No matter how it happens to us, accident, torture, suddenly at the top of our energies, quietly in bed, there'll come this flash this light of a colour we've never seen before. It's a glorious moment, beloved. Even for the simpleton, even for him, his foolishness falls away, just as from the madman his madness falls away. In the instant they know death, so they know truth. In the blinding light of truth, they know death, one and the same. I promise you, trust me, love, oh my love, oh my Victor, oh my heart.